Welcome to MGBs and Other Stuff, a channel that explores MGBs and other things that interest me. Hopefully, you'll find it interesting too. Please consider liking and subscribing. This video is about my nostalgic obsession with small cars, especially MGBs. There is something about small cars, they're fun, noisy, the connection to the road, and, the fit. Ah yes, the fit. You kind of wear a two-seater, like you would wear your favorite jacket. It's up close and personal, not at all like driving your living room down the road. Whether solo or with a co-pilot, shoulder to shoulder, you seek out winding roads and scenic routes that engage you with the driving experience. A source of joy, not just conveyance. My obsession began in the early 70s. I was 7 years old and quite a bit smaller. My now brother-in-law, had a little red Fiat 850 Spider that he probably bought after seeing Dustin Hoffman driving in Alfa Romeo in the 1968 film, The Graduate. I was usually relegated to folding myself into the package shelf behind the seats, while he and my sister took me on their dates. He later bought a Mazda 808. It was called a Mazda RX-3 in other markets. I remember this car very well, we went everywhere in it. Several years passed, they married and moved away and, likely inspired by the Rockford Files, they bought a Pontiac Firebird. This car was around long enough that I actually had a chance to drive it. For a while, my mom had a Datsun B210. She used to let me steer it from the passenger side. For some reason, I really loved that car. I hoped it would be around long enough that I could drive it. But like most early imports, it would eventually succumb to rust. In high school, I almost bought a Door Wedge Triumph TR7. Instead, I opted for a 1975-era land yacht, the Ford Thunderbird. Talk about driving a living room. It was an excellent party car that could hold a bevy of friends. However, it was a thirsty beast, that got about 10 miles to the gallon and used a quart or two of oil a week. Scrounging enough coin to keep it going was always a challenge. I've had other cars too, but my favorite ones were always small. My wife and I drove a Volkswagen Golf to the East Coast. I had a hand-me-down Ford Lynx, and currently drive a beat-up old Mazda 3. If it's small, and standard, I like it. It doesn't have to be particularly fast or flash, just fun to drive. My obsession with MGBs probably started in the mid-70s. I'm 8 years younger than my brother and 10 years younger than my sister. So I was the real baby in the family. In 76 I would have been 13 years old. It was around this time that my brother acquired a MGB. I don't know what year it was, or even the color. Red seems right though and it must have been a 63 or 64. I mostly remember that it was either barely running or not running at all, and was stored in my parents' garage. My brother's MGB was very mysterious to me. He seemed very excited about it, but it was always in some state of repair. Spring would see the MG getting pushed out of the garage and causing a commotion on the street. Neighbors and friends would gather and offer advice on what it needed. Eventually it would come down to me pushing it around the neighborhood trying to bum start it. It would sputter to life, run for a bit, then stall. Not convinced that one more time ought to do it, we would eventually give up. Exhausted. Drenched with sweat and admitting defeat, we would muster the energy to push it back into the garage. Always anticipating success for the next weekend. I truly don't recall ever riding in that MGB, only pushing it. I do remember sneaking to the garage, uncovering the car, slipping into the driver's seat and making vroom vroom noises. I don't think my feet could reach the pedals, but I do remember how cool the instrument panel was. The gauges, dials, knobs and toggles would transport me into the cockpit of a Spitfire as I piloted my imaginary plane over the English countryside. Incidentally, I recently read an article about the first Spitfires, and their pilots. Apparently, the early planes were not equipped with rear-view mirrors. 
One of the pilots was an MG enthusiast and had an MG dealer supply him with one. And had it affixed to his plane. Oh, and the smell, the smell that every MGB has. An intoxicating mixture of oil, gas and leather, that through some sort of alchemy, combines into a musty tobacco metal-like smell. Still, to this day, it kinda reminds me of my grandfather. The MGB eventually went to a mechanic and got running. But my brother's girlfriend ended up rolling it. Thankfully no one was hurt. Fast forward to the 90s and I finally got my first MG. I was living in Edmonton at the time and purchased a 1980 rubber bumper B. I really liked this car, but ended up having it rewired, then rebuilt the engine and finally had to redo the front end. I did put a lot of miles on it. The car was an everyday driver in the short summer months and made an epic journey through the Rockies. Ironically, it ended up in my brother's hands. I think he eventually had it restored and sold it. It has been at least 25 years since I owned or drove a MGB, but I have never stopped obsessing about them. A couple of years ago I started seriously looking, but the right one never presented itself. I did have a lead on one that was about a 3 hour drive up north. It was a 67 that seemed to tick all the boxes, except that it lacked an overdrive unit. The price was right, it was British Racing Green, it had been restored and, from the pictures, seemed to be in pretty good nick. So we made the trip to go and see it. The seller also had restored an MGA, it was not for sale but was on display in his well-kept garage. I was excited when the door rolled open and revealed a very nice example of a MGB. We talked a bit, looked at pictures and documents then took it for a drive. It drove well, had an issue with one of the gears but overall was very nice. For some reason though, I just didn't feel it. I don't know why, I really wanted to be excited for it, but the feeling just wasn't there. We drove home empty-handed and a bit disappointed. But then. In August of 2021, the office where I work required attempt to cover a staff shortage. She and I got talking, and coincidentally, we both shared an interest in MGBs. She had recently bought one and told me that the gentleman that she bought from had another one for sale. She even brought hers to work one day and let me take it for a spin. It was just what I needed. I got the seller's number and called to arrange a time to meet with him. He lived just 10 minutes from where I work. When I arrived at his house, I noticed MG signs and other MG paraphernalia scattered about. Was I in some sort of MG heaven? I knocked on the door and met Jack for the first time, and his little dog too. Jack is in his early 80s and has some health issues so the first thing we did was sit down, have a smoke and look at a photo album full of pictures. He told me that there would be no negotiation on price. I knew right then and there, sight unseen, I was buying this car, no question. It soon became time to actually look at the car. This would prove to be a bit of an ordeal. He has two garages, or more accurately, one garage and a shed attached to one side. The MGB was in the shed part. Filled with anticipation I squeezed through the garage to get access to the shed. The garage, by the way, was bursting with MG parts, tools, and who knows what other treasures. I shimmied my way to the access door and felt my way into the unlit shed and eventually made my way to the door that would let the car out. I removed some stuff that was sitting on the bonnet along with the dusty bed sheets that covered the whole car. Jack said he had a new battery for it but hadn't installed it yet, so I pushed the car out into the daylight. It was stunning to look at, all chrome and iris blue, it was stunning. Jack's hands aren't what they once were, so he let me install the battery. Surprisingly, it started right up. Jack said he could smell gas and soon discovered that the fuel filter was leaking, and of course, he had a drawer full of spares. 
I installed the new one and we were good to go. At this point, having seen under the bonnet, hearing it run and reviewing the restoration pictures, I told him I would take it. He suggested that I take it for a test drive first. What follows is a tribute to Jack and an appreciation for his craft. Jack told me he has bought and sold over 100 MGs over the years. He had a career in the automotive industry as a setup man and has had a hobby obsession with MGs for a very long time. I have been back a few times for visits, and he always has something for me. Last time it was the original factory BMC radio that came out of the car. He had a drawer with no less than 10 from other MGs. Once I saw a MGA grill hanging on a nail on an outside wall. He said it had probably been there for 20 years. It was a little beat up but probably restorable. I have seriously considered making him an offer on the entire contents of his garage, but don't have the room for it. The car he sold me was his biggest project. He had acquired the car from someone he met at a pub slash bar in Manitoulin Island. It was last registered in 1973 before it was registered in 2002, after Jack restored it. He told me that he mostly just showed the car and has put about 5,000 miles on the restoration. Over the last few years, Jack has been having some difficulty getting in and out of the car. He said that it has been sitting for quite a while and has had several people interested, but was waiting for the right person to sell it to. Luckily, it was me. I thought I would share some specific details about this car. I think it's a pretty early body, even though a lot of the fittings are replacements. At any rate, here are the specs. 1963 MG MGB, Mark I Roadster. The first MGB was built in May of 1962. It received the production number 101. The first car built in 1963 was number 4619. There was around 500,000 built by the end of production in 1980. This car is number 2147 and has a body number of 2044. That puts the actual build date somewhere between May of 1962 and December 31, 1962. Car number GHN 3L-2147 G is the make, MGB H is the engine series, BMC N indicates that it is a two-seater roadster. 3 is the model series, Mark 1. L is left-hand drive for the North American market. 2147 is the build number. Engine number. 18, GB, RU, H39980. This engine is not original to the car. 1962 through 1964 cars would have had engines with three main bearings, G and GA series. This five main bearing GB series engine was manufactured between 1965 and 1967. The first one being numbered 101 and the last one being 91,200. That probably puts this engine in the 1965 to 1966 date range. 18 is 1,798 cubic centimeters of engine displacement. GB means 5 bearing main, closed circuit breathing and a dynamo. R is equipped with an overdrive. U is a 3 synchro mesh gearbox. H is high compression engine and 39980 is the engine number. Thanks for indulging me with this trip down memory lane and my obsession with this car. Today is Sunday, October 23rd, 2022. I thought I would leave you with some parting shots of a short drive I took through the Niagara countryside this afternoon. Not too many driving days left now.
In the next MGB video, I think I will share some more close-up details of this car, some of the things I've had to do to it, and since winter is coming, how I will put Iris to bed. There is more MGB stuff to come. Please leave comments or questions. And consider liking and subscribing. As always, octagonally yours.